Everyone got one? And also, if you're looking for where we are in the notes, we're on page 50 of your prison notes. We're looking at the topic of operability, specifically the operating method. So, of course, just to, uh, just to recap where we were the last class, we said operability, we were looking at various sources of, of variation in our processes. We were looking at variations caused by operator disturbances, by changes made to the process, uh, natural disturbances that occur, and so forth. So we went through those last class. Now we're going to look at the impact of those on our process. Uh, specifically, in the topic of operability, there's eight sections which we will not cover in this course. We will only cover one, two, and part of three, and then I'll, I'll touch on some of the other sections with a small case study. This case study, in fact, that we have in the handouts in front of you. So uh, this page that you've got is, we'll cover one of them today. It's the same, same, same uh, flow sheet for all the six duplications, but we'll look then at, say, the effect of safety equipment and um, transitions and then dynamic performance and monitoring and diagnosis, and we'll add to, these, add to this diagram over the next few days. So we're not going to use this entire diagram today. We'll be adding, adding to it as we go. So, Things they just to recap, we're in page 30 of your printed notes, and then secondly, I'm going to hand it. If you don't have one, there's something here at the front, so please grab it. Then the other piece of information that's important for today is in assignment 7, we, uh, we looked at that tutorial yesterday and you saw that detailed drawing. I was saying to the groups that I was meeting with in the SDL meetings last week, I was meeting with the B groups, and Alicia was meeting with the A groups, so I just want to make sure that you're all. Um, more consistent here. That level of detail that you see in the drawing in the assignment is the level of detail we expect to see in the flow sheet in the SDL report. But you do not expect that level of detail everywhere in the flow sheet. And only for the sections of the flow sheet related to the hazard and vulnerability study. So you don't see that, that very detailed PID for everywhere. Only for the sections related to the hazard and vulnerability up before, but we didn't really consider the opening part of that, the operability side. That's what we're getting into in detail in today's part. So whichever units you consider in the operability part of your report and the safety part of your report, you're going to add on some of the things we see in today's part and in the next few days. So as we look through this material in the coming days, don't just see the case studies I'm showing you. Consider how this material would apply to your unit, the units that you consider. Okay. So let's take a, take a look at, at the operating area. In the handout uh, that I've just given you, I will introduce the concept of an operating window. This is not on page 30 of the notes, by the way. So there's, I've just added this in here on a simpler case study. The case study that we're going to start off with is just one step ahead of where I want to be. I'm going to start a little simpler. We'll get to the slides in a minute. Take this uh, handout that's now in front of you and consider this process. We have a feed stream in liquid form going to a tank, and the level is being controlled in that vessel. That liquid stream is ultimately going to be used as our feed to this tank bed reactor down here. But before we get to that point, we take that liquid, pump it, the flow control over here, the flow control is used to maintain that level of the tank. We're pumping that flow of liquid through a heat exchanger first, where we preheat the preheat material enters the pack bed reactor. Exothermic reaction takes place. So now we have a hot stream leaving the pack bed reactor. And one of the things we like to do is in terms of energy integration is make use of that heat. We don't need it anymore. Rather than just sending that hot product on, let's exchange the heat with the incoming feed. So we preheat our incoming feed using the outlet from the pack bed reactor. This is not a difficult or complicated flow sheet. In fact, it's fairly straightforward. But it has a number of good engineering practices. We've got that heat integration taking place. For one, we see level control over there. We see our pump 
has one-way check valve <coughs> and backflow into this, um, into this current storage. So we've got a number of things that we've seen, and you might consider this flow sheet to be actually pretty good in terms of the level of control that's on there and the sensible energy integration. So from an engineering point of view, this, this looks pretty good, but there's actually a number of deficiencies that we're going to look at over the coming classes. But when we're considering operating window, I wanted to just introduce what I mean by operating window using this example. So operating window is the range of steady states we can achieve in this process. Now, most chemical processes, when we consider the range, that range is driven by the specifications over which the plant is intended to operate. We covered that last class. What are the disturbances that impact the process? What are the requirements for that process? They come from various inputs on our feed quality, our feed flow rate, our feed composition, the outlet composition of the product that we require to produce, the outlet flow of that product. All of those we covered last class as variables that are going to make adjustments to how we operate the process. So the key outcome from last class was we don't design a process for a single steady state. So now we're looking then, what is the range of steady states we do design for? And what we consider then is various manipulated variables that we control. So these are operator changes and disturbances. These are changes that happen without our, our, our wanting them to happen. Let's take a look at the operating window specifically around just the simple part. So that we'll introduce the concept of operating window just on that part of the flow sheet. Now for most processes, we design them to operate at some nominal point. We also then say, well, let's consider the design of this process so it can work at 60% to 110%. In the absence of extra information, those are reasonable bounds to consider. And so in your SDL project, you may design your flow sheet for 100%, but you must also simulate your flow sheet for 60% throughput up to 110% throughput. Unless you have other information that will tell you otherwise, those are good ranges to make sure that our process operates at. So when we're considering this range of steady state operations, 60 to 100 percent is reasonable. So what is it, what's going to change on this flow sheet if I operate at low throughput of 60 percent? I want to produce a product that only has 60 percent of my usual capacity. What is, it, what is it that I change in that flow sheet? that pump, I get a lower and lower 
pressure on the outlet. So the, the, the amount of air that I can produce on the out, outlet of that pump decreases as I increase the flow. Up to a certain point where even if I open that valve all the way, if that valve has the capacity or the range to go at higher values, eventually I just will not get any any head coming out through that pump. And in many curves, this falls off pretty, pretty sharply. So when I design this process, I need to design it for 60 to 110 percent. I need to design it so that that whatever corresponds to 60 to 110 percent falls well within the range that that pump curve is. Or in other words, I should purchase my pump so that this pump curve can handle the range from 60 to 110 percent. So here's my nominal 100 percent throughput. I need to ensure that I've got some room to move at higher flow rates and at lower flow rates. So essentially my operating window for this simple process is this line. I move, I'll be moving along this line. As I go from 110% up here, let's say, my design corresponds to 100%, 110% I'll be operating at this flow rate with that corresponding pressure all the way down to say 60% throughput on the process, I'll get a, a higher head. So my design, my operating window, is the level of steady states. Every time I change the flow rate, I'll reach a new steady state operating pressure in that pipe And I'll be somewhere along that line. So a very simple operating window in this case. I'm somewhere along that straight line. Okay, that, that's clear. So let's take a look at this next example. Then. This, this is now in your notes on page 30. So it's called slide number one, but it's physical page 30 in section eight. This process now has the two-dimensional operating window. <coughs> We've got a flash valve. Coming into our flash, we have a cold heat. If I'm going to preheat that cold heat, here's my hot process fluid from some other stream, from some other part of my flow sheet, I have a hot process fluid. I can open and close that valve to adjust the rate through the heat exchanger for that process fluid. That fluid gets warmer, so T1 over here is a colder temperature than T2. And I've got redundancy, T2 and T4. That water stream goes to a second heat exchanger where I'm going to heat it even more with steam going to condensate. So T5 is, is, a, is a warm, a, even hotter still. Enter the flash drum, I have flashing occurring, I have some liquid forming at the bottom that's maintained at a certain level with that valve over there. So this valve over here sets the flow rate through out of the system based on the liquid level, and then here I've got the pressure being regulated at the top. So again, 60 to 110 percent, in the absence of better information, we are asked to design this process to make sure that it operates under some nominal range of conditions. And here, let's assume that those ranges correspond to a lower bound over here of about 60, whatever the units these are, meters cubed per hour, up to 180. So that's my range of feed flow or capacity through the, through the flash drop. But there's also temperatures. Temperatures in my incoming feed is a disturbance. So let's, let's just recap in my x-axis. This is a requirement. My process must be able to operate between a lower flow and an upper flow. That's my design window. That's my requirement. But my temperature, I know that my temperature of the feed coming in is variable. This comes from some upstream process that is not well controlled. And let's say that that feed stream could be anywhere from minus 10 degrees to 60 degrees. So that's my disturbance. It's essentially, you could also consider it as part of the specification, but it's a disturbance from upstream. Normally, we expect that feed to be at zero degrees. So that's why my design point over here is at zero degrees. And normally, I consider it to be operating at 100 on the feed flow. That's my nominal point. But my operating window now calls for a wider range of operation. So at steady state, I hope to be 
somewhere between those bounds and those bounds, based on my my knowledge of what I'm designing for. Okay. Now we've got some constraints there shown. Those yellow lines and some of those constraints we call call them hard constraints, and some are soft constraints. My hard constraint up here, this, this line all the way over to the to the right. What defines what might define that constraint? To let's say what I'm looking for rather is how would I manipulate myself to move across that x-axis, and what would that lead me to landing up right at this constraint? What would I be adjusting to move left and right here? steady state. If either, whichever valve I open, I'm, I have to open them so that at that point, one of them is at 100%. So this line represents the maximum capacity I cannot go beyond. I could not ever achieve a feed flow greater than 180 on this system. And so that operating window, this vertical line is, is, is bound over there. Over here, I'm bound at a non-zero flow at 60. That's a soft constraint. That's when I'm closing the valve to whatever percentage leads me to operate at that point. This is a minimum throughput that I expect through the process, but it's called a soft constraint. I definitely can go beyond that or below, below that. Okay, so certain of our bounds on these operating windows will be hard constraints and some will be soft constraints. So here we have a hard one on the left. I cannot go beyond 100%. But over here, I definitely could go beyond, below that the soft constraint. Especially we will see temporary, temporary disturbances might lead us to go outside this boundary. My feedback control system that's regulating the flow through the system might temporarily take me outside this window, but then bring me back in again at steady state. Okay, my lower bound here is defined based on my feed composition, uh, feed temperature coming in at minus 10 and the upper value at plus 60. Now, that, how would I get, if my feed coming in is at plus 60 all the way down to minus 10, how would I get a, temp, how would I get a point to be exactly at that condition? The worst case condition is when my feed comes in at 60 degrees and I've got my valves shut on the heat exchangers over here. That's the way I would get to that constraint up here. So I know that my feet can come in between minus 10 and plus 60. So on a day that my feet does come in at 60, I would need to then close those valves. So I'm not supplying any additional heat to that feet. So that I prevent myself from leaving that feasible region. So again, that, that is a hard constraint. I can't, can't go below 0% valve open. This one over here, this diagonal constraint, is a little more interesting. Any ideas on, on that one? How it comes about? Huh? Uh, you probably can't feed it in too quickly at a low temperature, because then you can't flash it all out. But quick enough, then you can increase the heat or whatever. Right, so at very high feed flow, if I'm operating at, say, 180, 170 feet flow coming in, I must, I must increase the temperature of my feet so that I can achieve a flash. And the only way I do that is by making sure that those valves are open. Okay, so higher temperatures require me, to, uh, higher flows require me to make sure that my, my temperature coming in 
is, is high enough so I can achieve the, the required flash. So in this case, my operating window is a 2D, 2D window with some unusual constraint. We offer some <coughs> box constraints, but we can get um, diagonal lines. Okay, so, so this slide really covers what I've said there verbally. And there's a bit of the um, a different balance, more on the different balance that I just discussed. Here's another example. We've got B coming into a reactor, so A being reacted to B in an exothermic reaction. I've got coolant supplied to the reactor to make sure I, I achieve a certain temperature and remove that heat. And then I've got the material being removed from the reactor with the pump. Two variables in my operating window that I'm interested in are the concentration of A, in other words, the that well mixed vessel that would be the concentration leaving of the unreacted B. So I want to react A to B, but I'm going to have some unused reactant leaving out in the, in, the, in the feed over there. Then the temperature is the second variable. Now my operating window here is defined by that, that shape. You've seen that before. So that, that curved shape of temperature versus concentration is simply my steady state equation from a first order system. So it's a first order reaction occurring at higher and higher outlet concentrations of my feed. So remember this concentration here on my next axis has my feed, CA, requires me to operate at lower temperatures. This bound over here, this is the region of steady states that I can operate along. So either I can choose to operate at higher temperatures and then I would have less of my reactant leaving the vessel, or if, as I move to lower temperatures, I get a higher concentration of reactant leaving my vessel. So that shape over there defines my feasible region of steady states. So that's, a, again, emphasizing that from the operating window to the steady state of the process. <coughs> now, we have to recognize, as I said in the previous case, we, we can deviate into that infeasible region periodically. And we usually, we, we, we do not want to do that. Those, those bounds are, are often also defined by safety constraints. So we prefer not to deviate into the infeasible region, but we, we can quite easily deviate into that. Um, let's take a look in this specific example how that might happen, is if I have, let's take a look at time, we'll look at, at three variables. Here's the concentration of A coming in, so my feed concentration. Then my, I'll look at my outlet concentration, CA. That's the one variable I'm plotting on my x-axis here, the reactants. And then I can look at temperature, because it's time. So if I had a situation occurring where I had a step change in my CA0, CA then would What would happen to CA and what would happen to the temperature T? So roughly at this time, we have a step change occurring in my inlet concentration. Now we have, we'll add, we've got some coolant controlling the temperature in that tank. expect to happen to CA the moment there's an increase in the feed concentration. What will happen to the unreacted A's concentration? This will go up and we'll see a first order response initially. Then my temperature will also take a bit of time and it will also go up. Then my feedback controller kicks in. If the temperature is high, I'm going to increase the fluid flow. So it's going to start doing that until it settles out. And CA will also do that, depending on the dynamics of your, of your feedback control system. So we'll see this oscillation then in CA, and it will steady out at some new steady state value for CA. 
and some new temperature T that was stepping out. So we started at some some condition for C A and, and T, and we will end up at, at a new steady state for both those variables. Let's take a look at what the implication is of that on this uh, operating window plot. So if we plot here C A, which is my x axis and T, and my operating window, let's say, defined by that. Initially, I'll be be over there and then so CA my initial point is at lower temperature lower concentration my final point B, so this is point A is maybe that point C my final point B is at a higher concentration and at a higher temperature But what we'll see is that during that, that transient period, we'll have something like this occur. Essentially, C A versus temperature. For a period of time, you'll deviate out into the infeasible region, but then steady out back into the feasible. So we will see deviations in many cases outside our operating window, but there should be transients. And that steady state, we should be brought back in. We're hoping to operate within that operating window at steady state all the time. Now, depending on the nature of this transient behavior, if this bound here was a safety critical bound, this sort of change would not be desirable. Okay, and, I and I have to ensure that I would not get some variation in my field to avoid deviating outside my bound. But if this bound were not too safety critical, I might accept I might accept this for a temporary duration. <coughs> so our, our operating window bounds, if there's safety related constraints on there, we need to ensure that we do not allow operation outside those bounds for for, for whatever duration. Okay, so operating windows, very much a 2D um, perspective right now, and that's the easiest way to look at it, but you can quickly see how this can grow to be larger and larger on, on a more complicated flow sheet. So we will define these operating windows, or we will find them, I should say, using flow sheeting software or simulation software. We could do this empirically on an existing plant by plotting a variety of steady state operating points against each other. But that, that can be part of my part because we can almost never obtain steady state operation in an actual process. The other thing is, as I just said, we, our operating window is almost never two-dimensional. It's a multi-dimensional shape, but we will look essentially at the corner points. That's really our only way to deal with this because if we've got four or five or multiple variables that we need to consider the steady states for, we really could not go and look at all the combinations of those variables and plot their operating windows. So we essentially just resort to a fairly crude approach and look at the operating window at the extremes of those and simulate our processes at those extreme points, hoping that in the interior it's still feasible and safe operation. So, so that really is the only practical way we have to do this. And then those extremes then would go to hold in, in the design basis. So the design basis for the flow sheet or for the plant that we're looking at, um, we specify what those extremes are. So let's take a look at, at, at the heat exchanger. We'll look at a few more case studies. Here a heat exchanger. Cooling water coming into the tubes and then leaving again. And then we've got our hot process fluid coming in on the shelf side and leaving over here. The purpose of this exchange is to cool this hot stream down to a specific outlet temperature T. What would be the various combinations of variables you consider? Specifically the variables that will lead to the worst case operation of this unit. How would you define the operating window? 
in terms of which variables firstly, which variables define your operating window, and then secondly, at what level you set those variables to get the worst case. So I'd like you to, to think about it for a minute or two and talk with the person next to you to identify what those variables are and what at what levels they are. You get the extra crispy uh, paper. Mm. Yeah. I think Patrick was sleeping there. I woke up at 11 o'clock. Oh, did you? So I highly recommend you give this a try because the final exam is going to be just a sequence of questions on case studies. That's the only way we can examine operability is by looking at a variety of case studies. There's no guidelines. It's not like policy economics where it's not in the apply to the For so this operating window topic, we're really just considering a variety of case studies and it's important to be able to understand the thing you require. You'll also have to apply this for your SDL project. So a list of the variables you would consider important to find that operating window. Secondly, at what level should those variables be for the worst case conditions? To make sure our heat exchange is designed and programmed. I will also add that the final exam will be primarily on this topic and on safety. The economics will pay very little part of the final exam. So this is crucial that we understand this topic and be able to apply this concept. No, that's what I'm not saying. There will be one economic section. I don't know. Maybe these things will be water and then tea and tea. Well, if you're working with tea, how do you take a tea and tea and tea? You can't. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. So you're just saying that you can water. Yeah. You can adjust the floor. You can't, you can't change the temperature of the water. It's the same stuff. Like you just use water. Yeah, but you're, you're operating with it based on disturbance, right? You have disturbance in the water and your temperature, but you can't really have to do like if you're, if you're controlling the cooling water, it's not a disturbing. It's a filter. Uh, I didn't do Did you work on your lab? Yeah. Um, oh, the PH people want to make it all these things. Uh, I'll be after it. We should take a slow little bit right after. Are you going to do those? Dude, you just have to laugh at it. Oh, yeah. Are you sure you can do it? I sent you a demo. In my email or my email. Maybe I sent it to you, but then it's myself. Uh, well, I would say it's over here. Oh, check. Yeah, it's for the other suggestions? Look, yeah, say temperature you get out. Takes the temperature of the product stream. <coughs> this is process is designed to achieve a certain temperature in general, but if our basis calls for a variety of temperatures that abound, we that would form part of my operating window. Other suggestions? Yeah. Of which flow rate of both curves of F of cooling water and flow rate of process. Any other variables that would define your operating window? 
There's a four up here that would define a four-dimensional operating window. There's another variable. Consider the, the, the types of variables we looked at in last class. We said that there's variables that are intentionally changed by operators and engineers. Then there's disturbances. You have a reduction in area because of foul. Foul. So, so fouling in my heat exchanger is another variable that exists and will affect my operating window. So very large dimension of for a large combination of variables to consider if we were looking at 2D operating windows. That's obviously excessive. So what is the worst condition that could exist in the heat exchanger capital cost here. You're really essentially over designing the system. <coughs> that might help you. So you were going to say I was going to say on the on the opposite side or the side of that, like the cooling water comes in really hot and then the, you don't get any cooling essentially. Right. So cooling water comes in really hot, but that would mean that you really need a very large heat exchanger. Right? You've got hot, hot cooling water, so cooling water temperature high exit temperature of product to achieve the lowest bound on that, on that outlet. The worst case is also then with a very low flow of incoming cooling water and a very high temperature of cooling water. So essentially I need an excessively large heat exchanger to achieve the desired duty that I'm after. With a very high level of balance. Okay, so all of those would lead to a very expensive heat exchanger, a very large area heat exchanger. Do we design our process for this condition? No. If we design our processes for this, these very excessive conditions, we'd be spending a lot of money on them. Okay, so we usually cut back on this. We essentially recognize the probability of this combination occurring is extremely low. So it wouldn't make sense to design for this particular case. But we certainly want to understand the deviation that if this had to occur, how much would we, would we suffer? So we would still verify this condition in our simulation, but we wouldn't necessarily design our process to handle it every day. Okay. Now, consider this case study. The design specification, uh, consider the flow, I should say, the system. What variables must we determine what's the worst case in this particular system? So we're pumping fluid from a vessel. So here's my vessel pumped, centrifugal pumped, flow through a heat exchanger, and then by a bit of tubing, another heat exchanger, and then into that reactor. What would be the variables to determine in the operating window? Again, what is the worst case? So essentially, there's another case study for you to work through. So give it a give it a minute or two and talk with the person around you. Yeah. Same question on the 
what is the question? Yeah, the second one, I of the temperature part. Why would the worst case be the second because if, uh, let's say that uh, my, okay, so just a question before we get into this one in, asking, we're referring to this outlet temperature here. That outlet temperature <coughs> might be called for at say minus, minus five degrees C. But in our, in our design, we're saying, well, I want to be able to achieve minus 10 up to zero. So I'm designing for a nominal of minus five, but I would also like to achieve minus 10 up minus half of zero on my output. So the worst combination would be if I've got a really hot stream coming in and I want to get to minus 10. So I've got a, a very large temperature or a large amount of heat I want to use the fluid. And then I've got a very warm stream available on it to do that. So it's, a, it's, it's really an excessive, excessive power. Normally, this might not feature in the operating room. This variable might, could well be removed and say we just always want to design this exchange to always achieve a certain single value. But we also have to recognize that we're never going to get that. So we, we design for a range of values. And the worst combination would be when this is at its lowest value, if we're wanting to achieve the lowest. Maybe there's a, a unit coming after this that's calling for the feed to be at, at minus 10. So we have to be able to design this heat exchanger to achieve that. And that's going to define our own thing as well. Makes more sense now? A little bit more? Okay. So let's take a look at, a, at another example then just to, just to understand how we're putting it in. So the tank, the pumping fluid out through a valve, two heat exchangers are in the part of that before we get to the reactor where that fluid is intended to be. What would be the variables you consider in, the, in that operating window? And again, what would be the worst conditions that the people would have? So give that a minute or two. Achieve. 
Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at flow again. So flow is not going to be affected by composition. Little in, little in the feed tank. So all the things from your fluid flow course that were important. Speed. So pumps are normally set to run at a fixed speed. So that's we will take that variable could be considered if we want a variable to be drive. But generally we're, we're operating at fixed speeds. Um, I, you're on the right track. We would call that the friction factor, essentially. Essentially, it's hindering the flow. For that. So friction factors. Or a longer flow <coughs> Other variables? Sure. Yeah, I guess we're, uh, we're considering up to the point where it enters the reactor. Okay. So, yeah. But related to the reactor, what, what could, how could this reactor have an effect on the flow through the system? Pressure in the reactor, the back pressure coming along that. So back, back pressure from the reactor. If whatever's occurring in this reaction generates a vapor phase and the valve leaving the, the reactor, if there was a vapor phase leaving there, and that was partially closed, we would generate sufficient back pressure to counteract the flow of the fluid itself. So fluid temperature will adjust the viscosity, which will change how we are able to pump that fluid. Other variables? Pressure drops along those heat exchanges. So delta P across those heat exchanges would affect. The length of that piping, so whatever this distance is from this vessel to the final reactor. So all of those get taken into account when we're designing, designing the system. So and there's the worst combination of them. We've got the lowest level in that, in that vessel, a very high friction factor along the long piece of piping, very high degree of pressure drop over those, those uh, heat exchanges and then a high back pressure coming back at us. So all of those are, are variables that will affect our operating rules for a given, for a given set of pipes. So generally then we'll work the other way around. We'll design our fluid flow system to achieve a certain flow rate. And those are typical values down here, meter per second for liquid flow, 30 meters per second for gas flow. And we spoke a bit in the tutorial yesterday about how we size those pipes to achieve that particular flow, but then also there's an economical pipe diameter, which is <coughs> the capital cost of, of, of the pipe versus the pressure drop we experience. So essentially all the, the flow through that system is determined by those, those variables which would then set our operating rounds, our operating window. So these, these case studies will help us uh, start to understand what operating window refers to. You should be starting to look at how operating window can be Consider in your particular function how specifically you're going to identify that operating window's range. Okay, so those are questions that you need to start thinking about in your mind.